So welcome everyone. My name is Chandler Swope and I am the Director of Youth Services for the Huntington's Disease Youth Organization. Um, and I'm very excited to introduce Natalie. Natalie has been a longtime volunteer of HDO. She has been helping out at the North American camp for a number of years, providing yoga therapy for our campers here in North America. And with the current situation with COVID-19, we wanted to be able to bring something to families who are at home quarantining around the world. We know that movement um, and yoga therapy in general can be beneficial for stress relief, for anxiety, for our physical and mental well-being, um, but it can be hard if there are mobility challenges. Natalie is an expert at this. She has developed yoga for those experiencing Huntington's disease. She comes from an HD family. I'm going to let her share her story a little bit. So I am so excited to introduce Natalie um, and be able to offer Natalie's expertise to the larger HD community um, with this new HDO yoga program. So Natalie, I'll have you take it away and I'm going to turn off my camera and give it all. all if you must, Chandler. Okay, so thank you um, for that awesome introduction. So yes, I'm a certified yoga therapist. Um, what that means is that um, I've done a lot of extra training to work with people with various injuries and ailments over the past few years. And I've been working with the HDYO at their camps. Um, I'm from Toronto, Canada. So I work locally with the Huntington Society of Canada here. I've done presentations at their uh, national conferences, as well as I run the Toronto chapter. So I'm the Toronto chapter president representing. So I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of stuff within the HD community, but this project here with HDO is something that's been in the works for a long time. It's been a personal goal of mine. So thank you all for being on here. Um, as Chandler said, is that you will uh, be able to type whatever you need to. So if you have questions as they come up, please put them in the chat. Chandler can always ask me them. We are going to do a Q&A afterwards. And if you do find this information useful, please share it with the people around you um, because we're really expanding this project to uh, support people globally. So I'm going to go ahead and share one of my screens. We're going to get started um, with this. Mind if it's not on the right one. And then if you can see my screen, okay, we're going to just start at the beginning and hit play. Okay, good. All right. So I'm going to assume you can see this. Uh, maybe Chandler pop on so I can see your video. Give me a thumbs up so I know that that's uh, clear. Yes, so yoga, you're okay, perfect. Thanks. So yoga as therapy for HD. One of the um, questions I get a lot when people think about, well, what kind of yoga should I do? Um, is because there's so many different types of yoga being offered generally. You can open up your Instagram or your Facebook and you can find tons of yoga that are for general fitness or hips and shoulders and all that kind of stuff. And today I'm going to present the case um, of specific practices for people affected by Huntington's disease. So my story, um, I grew up in an HD family. If you can see the little picture on the left uh, when I was a kid, that's me and my grandfather. Um, my grandfather was diagnosed with HD when I was really young. I never knew him um, without HD. So that was something that was um, always present in our lives. Now, when we were growing up, we didn't have a lot of these organizations. So it's not like we had a lot of info. It was just like, oh, well, you know, Nanu, which is grandfather in my culture's language, Nanu is sick and um, he moves a lot and he has these things and something we just dealt with. My grandmother took care of him for a long time and all the siblings did as well. Um, and it wasn't until my mom got diagnosed um, that I really started to understand and learn about the disease process. Like I knew it was genetic, but we didn't understand that I had a 50% chance of inheriting the same gene. So when my mom got diagnosed, I was in my late teens, early twenties. Um, and shortly after that, I was in a car accident. So I was unable to move my neck and head. So I had really, really bad whiplash and injuries from being rear-ended. Um, my car was totaled. Um, I spent a year and a half in severe pain, not being able to work. I wasn't able to uh, do certain things. My life was really, really shattered. Um, and then one of my family members invited me to come to a yoga class. And legitimately out of desperation, 
I tried yoga. It wasn't something that I was used to doing. Um, at the time, I was into um, kickboxing and some martial arts, so yoga really didn't come into my my scope of practice or what I was exposed to. Um, and I was doing something called hot yoga, which is almost torture, 40 degree room and you're sweating with a whole bunch of people. And the first class, I literally thought I was going to pass out. Like it was not, I did not enjoy that class. I didn't enjoy the second class, but I had an, an aunt that was paying for my membership. So I just kept going. And then after about the sixth class, I noticed a really big change in my mood and in my body. I it was the first time that I had felt reduced pain. So I knew something was in that. So yoga for me started out of a place of real necessity. It has taken me probably close to a decade to properly heal my body from that chronic pain. And that's, I'll get into a little bit more of that as we move through this process. But it was also a practice that was there for me as the roles in my family were changing. So I lived alone with my mom. I have two uh, other family members, but they, um, let me just check this chat because it's popping up in my, ooh, there we go. Ooh. Um, I have two other family members, but they weren't um, in my physical vicinity for a while. So it was her and I, and I basically, had to become my mom over probably four or five years where it was the shift of my mom slowly losing ability to do stuff and me taking on greater and greater roles and not really feeling prepared for that. So uh, this here is my mom in the top. That's when she could still walk. That was one of our um, really fun events that the HSC used to put on, which is the, um, it was a casino night. Uh, we had a we had a really good time, uh, and that's my mom. Uh, the last two years, she's um, been in full time care for about five or six years, um, because obviously I can't do all the stuff anymore at home, and um, we had to put her in long term care. So one of the things I I always want to share with people is this quote from one of the most famous yogis um, in North America, and his name is uh, B K S Iyengar. Um, you might know him as Iyengar Yoga. Um, he says that yoga helps us to cure what we need not, what need not be endured, and to endure what cannot be cured. At the time that I was going through all of the pain and all of the mobility issues and taking care of my mom, I was at risk for Huntington's disease. I have since tested negative, but I lived probably eight to ten years believing that this was going to be my future. So. I knew that either way, whether I was going to test positive or not, I needed to do something to help me endure what was coming. These are some of the organizations that I get to work with now and teach this workout. Uh, obviously, you know, the HDYO, YPAD. So for those of you that are across the globe, um, YPAD is the young people affected by Huntington's disease. This is our Canadian <laughs> version of, let's say, like the, um, the NYA and the Huntington side of Canada. Um, I find a lot of support through these groups. Um, when my mom was getting worse, I was getting closer and closer with my social workers and kind of making this network of support for myself. So today we're going to cover what is yoga. We're going to look at really what the impact of stress and chronic stress is on health. That's probably the number one burden that we're facing today. And um, we're going to look at depression in HD and how these practices like yoga and exercises and different um, types of training have a physical effects on your brain. And then we'll go into really what we're starting this Saturday. So what is yoga? Some of you uh, teach yoga. Some of you have gone to yoga classes. Um, yoga is recognized as a form of mind-body medicine. And it integrates a physical, uh, a person's physical, mental, and emotional aspects to improve their overall health. It's especially helpful for stress-related illnesses. It's over 5,000 years old as a tradition. That's what we know of. And the National Institutes of Health classify yoga as a form of complementary and alternative medicine. So these practices I'm going to offer you today are not designed to be standalone. They're designed to work with your existing medical program. They're not separate from it. Um, why is yoga so beneficial? 
because it produces the opposite state of your fight and flight response. And when we go into what stress is, we're going to learn the divisions of your nervous system and why that is important for your overall health and well-being. Practicing yoga regularly promotes strength, endurance, flexibility, while facilitating characteristics of friendliness, compassion, greater self-control, and well-being. And I think all of us can use a sense of greater well-being these days. So chronic stress and stress-related illness. So stress um, in a medical or biological context is something that's either physical, mental, or emotional that causes you to have bodily um, or mental tension. So you notice that in that description, it doesn't say what those things are, because what those things are, some things are universal. Let's say lack of finances is universally stressing for people. Um, living with illness can be stressing. Living with a sick person can be stressful. Basic things, um, so what affects other people are not always universal. Stresses can be external, meaning they could be from your environment or they can be internal. There can be things that you're dealing with as an illness, whether it's a mental health issue, whether you have depression or chronic pain or relentless thoughts that keep going in your mind. These are all things that are considered stressors. Um, in the case of chronic stress, we start to have a whole host of problems. So this is the point where I'm going to switch my slides for you. And we're gonna watch about a four minute in a moment, we're gonna watch about a four minute video um, on the impact of chronic stress. And I show this video um, to all of my students and all of the people that I do workshops with because it is really important that you know what is happening in your own biology, what is happening to your physiology when you're under loads of stress and how it's impacting your gene expression and the health of all of your organs and mental faculties. So uh, Chandler, again, I'm gonna hit play. Let me know if the sound works um, and then so that I can make the screen bigger. So yep. here it goes. You're good. Okay. Are you sleeping restlessly, feeling irritable or moody, forgetting little things and feeling overwhelmed and isolated? Don't worry, we've all been there. You're probably just stressed out. Stress isn't always a bad thing. It can be handy for a burst of extra energy and focus, like when you're playing a competitive sport or have to speak in public. But when it's continuous, the kind most of us face day in and day out, it actually begins to change your brain. Chronic stress, like being overworked or having arguments at home, can affect brain size, its structure, and how it functions, right down to the level of your genes. Stress begins with something called the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, a series of interactions between endocrine glands in the brain and on the kidney, which controls your body's reaction to stress. When your brain detects a stressful situation, your HPA axis is instantly activated and releases a hormone called cortisol, which primes your body for instant action. But high levels of cortisol over long periods of time wreak havoc on your brain. For example, chronic stress increases the activity level and number of neural connections in the amygdala, your brain's fear center. And as levels of cortisol rise, electric signals in your hippocampus, the part of the brain associated with learning, memories, and stress control, deteriorate. The hippocampus also inhibits the activity of the HPA axis, so when it weakens, so does your ability to control your stress. That's not all though. Cortisol can literally cause your brain to shrink in size. Too much of it results in the loss of synaptic connections between neurons and the shrinking of your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that regulates behaviors like concentration, decision-making, judgment, and social interaction. It also leads to fewer new brain cells being made in the hippocampus. This means chronic stress might make it harder for you to learn and remember things, and also set the stage for more serious mental problems like depression and eventually Alzheimer's disease. The effects of stress may filter right down to your brain's DNA. An experiment showed that the amount of nurturing a mother rat provides its newborn baby plays a part in determining how that baby responds to stress later in life. The pups of nurturing moms 
turned out less sensitive to stress because their brains developed more cortisol receptors, which stick to cortisol and dampen the stress response. The pups of negligent moms had the opposite outcome, and so became more sensitive to stress throughout life. These are considered epigenetic changes, meaning that they affect which genes are expressed without directly changing the genetic code. And these changes can be reversed if the moms are swapped. But there's a surprising result. The epigenetic changes caused by one single mother rat were passed down to many generations of rats after her. In other words, the results of these actions were inherited. It's not all bad news though. There are many ways to reverse what cortisol does to your stressed brain. The most powerful weapons are exercise and meditation, which involves breathing deeply and being aware and focused on your surroundings. Both of these activities decrease your stress and increase the size of the hippocampus, thereby improving your memory. So don't feel defeated by the pressures of daily life. Get in control of your stress before it takes control of you. Wonderful. Okay. So did we learn something new? Type in the chat, yeah? Is there something you didn't know before? So, oops, hold on a second. I'm still on. There we go. So I'm gonna go back to this. So now we know a little bit more and we're looking to see how this role of stress plays into our day-to-day -day life. So what are the major causes of stress? For most people, it's a lack of knowledge. So maybe there's something that they don't know and it's something in their life and it's affecting them. Some people, it's a loss of control. It could be a combination of these things, having no or limited resources available and uncertainty. So if we look at what it's like to grow up and live in a family with HD, you can see how potentially our ancestors, the people that came before us, maybe had these issues of chronic stress and had these different epigenetic changes that were passed down towards us. You know, for an example, I can think of how stressed my mom was um, throughout her life and then having us and all that kind of stuff makes it setting the stage for your brain to have these physical changes in them. But like the video says, there is hope. So yoga like I said, is over 5,000 year old tradition. It was compiled or the teachings of yoga were uh, compiled by somebody called Patanjali. And he's set to be a sage and he's depicted in that coiled uh, person slash snake figure you see on the right. But this whole book on yoga was describing the relationship between our minds and the experience of suffering. And it was offered as a user's manual to reducing suffering for individuals now we have very uh, various tools so if we think of what um, is the difference between the western or biomedical approach currently towards healthcare and what is different um, in yoga therapy or different mind body modalities it's that we don't separate an individual's mind from their body that's a really big one we're not treating just your mind or just your knee or your shoulder we're looking at the whole individual including their environment so what's happening outside of them what's happening inside of them so we call this a biopsychosocial approach bio meaning genes and nutrition your psycho means your emotion behaviors thoughts and your social stress trauma and the environment so this is a holistic way to treat people because we're treating the person first and not the ailment. The primary goals of yoga for HD, the first goal is to prevent or reverse the effects of chronic stress. So that's number one. When we think of what we are doing in our new group class of Saturday, what we're offering people, we want to make sure that chronic stress is not negatively impacting that person's genes and physiology. The second focus we have is to maintain their current health and mobility. So if we can do nothing else, 
we need to maintain what we have. That could be maintaining swallowing, maintaining strength, maintaining that ab ability to walk or to move or to lift or to think. We want to maintain as many functions as we can. And the third thing is we're looking at prevention. How can we prevent future problems wherever it is possible to do so? So it's not fancy. I don't need you to stand on your head or be able to touch your toes. <laughs> the whole goal of this is to prevent stress, maintain health and mobility, and prevent problems. So what's the difference? We talked about all these different things. So you can go to power yoga, hot yoga, kundalini yoga, um, ashtanga yoga. So what is this? What are we doing? So general yoga is intended for general people, people that don't have serious health uh, limitations, injuries, ailments. Um, they're for maintaining regular fitness. So they don't address specific things like Huntington's disease and neurological decline, but they do address movement. So that's going to be beneficial. But these practices are adapted for this in mind. Um, we are addressing the problem, so the potential of having your um, brain deteriorate with the different variations of Huntington's disease and the problems of the problem. So uh, some of you might um, be at risk, some of you might have lived at risk, some of you have gone through testing and tested positive or tested negative. There's so many problems of the problem of HD, fear, worry, chronic stress, loss, grief anticipatory grief which is you know a little bit unique to people in our boat where we are grieving a life or a loss that hasn't happened yet in the future um, and these issues can cause sometimes more suffering than the disease itself and here's um, how i'll put it to you we have as human beings between 50 and 70 thousand thoughts in a day in a day 50 to 70,000 thoughts now how many of those thoughts that you're thinking are helpful to you how many of them are harmful to you so how many of them by just thinking them are going to cause that stress response that we've seen that degenerates the brain and how many are neutral they're not good or bad they're just thoughts i can tell you from living at risk the majority of my time was occupied by worry and fear and anticipatory grief and so every time your mind is racing and moving, it's either contributing to that chronic stress or it's going to be neutral or let's hope we can change the way that we're thinking by redirecting our attention and our focus through yoga, yoga therapy, movement exercise um, so that we're eliminating all the extra noise and we're giving our body a real fighting chance to live well for a longer period of time. So the focus here is neuroprotection, reducing stress and anxiety, and to strengthen the individuals. We want to build you up to be as resilient and strong as you can against changing stresses in the environment, inner and outer. So depression and HD. So some of you might already have suffered these things or see people that you have. I've been um, clinically depressed probably since I was a teenager. So outside of HD, I had a lot of other problems growing up, adverse childhood experiences. Um, but depression is one of the most common psychiatric conditions in Huntington's disease. Um, and it's both situational. So like I said, sometimes it's developing as a result of a diagnosis or a diagnosis in the family, the loss of ability to work, um, and all those changes that are external. And then sometimes it's biological. Sometimes that's the part of the brain that's being affected in HD and people no longer can regulate their mood or their emotions. This is a common symptom of depression. So um, each person will experience depression a bit differently and they'll have different combinations of symptoms at once. But really what I wanted to show you was these models of the brain. So when we look at um, chronic stress, depression, mental health, um, it's not enough to say just think positively because if you look at the diagram on the top where you'll see the more of the green and the orange diagram, it has an arrow pointing at someone's prefrontal cortex. And that's this guy right here. This is a newer part of our brain to develop as human beings. This part is um, 
is where we do our complex thinking, we regulate positive emotions, a lot of important things happen here. But if you look at a healthy brain that has a very active prefrontal cortex and you look at the brain on the right of it, you can see that that area has been diminished as well as some of the areas in the midbrain where you'll see, um, I don't know if my cursor will go there, but you'll see it's diminished. So there's actual physical changes to your brain over time when you've been depressed for a long time. So it's not enough to think positively or to use mantras or these just general practices that people will say, like do this and you'll feel better. You might not have the hardware supporting your mood to be any different. Okay, so I wanted you to give that, I wanted to give that to you. So in yoga, we have various tools that we use to increase different areas of our brain's mechanics and working. We have yoga asanas, which we call uh, yoga postures or practices. We have things called pranayama or chanting, which are mindful breathing techniques. And chanting is using sound to work uh, the throat and also to stimulate um, your rest and digest. We're going to get into that in a moment. We have meditation and mindfulness techniques. We also have philosophy and different principles and diet and lifestyle. For today, we're going to focus on the first three. So this is the, the three that are going to be incorporated in our yoga program for HD. So exercise and HD, the results have been in for a long time. The Huntington's disease community has known that as a disease progresses, an individual with HD will decline in health and become more sedentary. So not moving as much just generally. And although that we can't uh, alter that process, a routine exercise program can help address all areas of decline. So you can still become stronger, improve your balance and posture, and feel more control of your body with regular exercise. Improvement in deep breathing can also help maintain the ability to cough effectively, which in turn will help prevent choking and aspiration pneumonia. So my mom is now in the um, later stages of the disease where swallowing is a very big issue, um, her food. So we constantly kind of live in this little fear of this aspiration ammonia happening because of her ability to swallow or, or lack thereof. People who regularly exercise are able to clear secretions more effectively when they do have colds and pneumonia. So you want to keep all of the parts of your body that may be affected, you want to keep those parts as strong as possible. Research um, studies have also shown um, that different um, physical, mental, and emotional improvements happen even in people with HD when they exercise. Um, one can improve muscle tone and strength. Um, you can impact the quality of your sleep, and that's a really big issue for mental health, for health in general, for stress, is proper sleep, seven to eight hours of good sleep a night. Um, it reduces the incidence of other health conditions. So just because you're at risk for HD doesn't mean you can't have high blood pressure or heart disease or diabetes. Like we need to keep our vehicle, our vessel um, as strong <laughs> and as resilient as possible because there are so many things, even like we're not even talking about COVID right now. This is why we're all locked in here. Like we need to stay strong um, because there's things that are in the environment that, are, that can hinder our um, health very quickly. Mentally, we actually can stimulate the growth of new brain cells and prevent age-related decline. So one of the biggest benefits of exercise is for your brain. And this is even outside of HD. And it improves the ability to concentrate and to feel mentally sharp. So your mental faculties. Emotionally, you can energize yourself, make you feel good. You have a lot of endorphins that get released when you exercise. It can promote feelings of calm and well-being. And it has a really positive effect of, um, on depression, anxiety, and self, uh, stress and self-esteem. So we're going to look at how yoga and exercises particularly impact the brain. And it's one of the coolest things that you can ever learn because you literally can regrow parts of your brain that have uh, been dampened. So some examples of uh, muscle strengthening activities um, are pull-ups, push-ups, you can do climbing stairs, lifting weights, curl-ups, digging in the garden. Uh, walking is very good, although it's not directly strength, but it's very good for your brain to walk, um, run, and then yoga, cycling. 
the pictures on the left you see are me leading a group. You can see these little uh, bat-like objects or like batons. These are called club L's. Um, I studied and practiced with club L's uh, to rebuild my body um, over the past several years. Um, and one of the main reasons I've studied this, I actually went to go train with one of the founders of Club L Yoga named Summer Huntington. I actually went to go train with her because this is the practices I want to lead um, our community in. Yoga postures, so you can see them, they're different. You can see Mary Bendy people on Instagram, you can see all sorts of things, but really what yoga postures are for is to keep your body functioning optimally. Do your shoulders move? Do your hips move? Do you have strength in your legs? Are you able to hold your body upright? Are you able to breathe and, and maximize breath fully? It helps reduce um, impurities and blocks. So we can look at all the physical ways that yoga helps, but from an internal perspective, we can use different yoga poses to help aid digestion and elimination so that your gut stays a lot healthier and you're able to produce more chemicals like serotonin that are really um, important for positive mood states in your brain. It's also can be considered a positive stressor. When you go, um, when you intentionally exercise, it is a stress on the body, but it's something we call eustress. So it's a stress that actually helps you um, build more resilience in your body. It also provoke, um, helps to train your mind and body connection so that your mind is not always going in a million directions to those 40,000 thoughts. You're able to kind of focus them on maybe one or two, and that allows us to calm and focus ourselves. So this is a really important tool we have. And if you think about how does it work? So why is this practice so beneficial? When we breathe deeply and consciously, we have a nerve called the vagus nerve. And in the little diagram on the right side, you're going to see it highlighted in yellow. And that nerve is deep in your brainstem. It hooks into your inner ear and it also goes all the way down and it has fibers that encloses all of your organs. So this is the nerve that tells your body when it's stressed or when it needs to fight, fight or flees, freeze. So we saw that little uh, video with the, um, the bear and he lights up. So that's the vagus nerve triggering so that your HPA axis will start to give you the either the strength you need to get out of there or to fight. Like you're either going to flee the situation, you're going to fight it off, or you're going to freeze. So when we breathe deeply, we actually stimulate part of that vagus nerve. So if I were to show you a little bit more of like my trunk, towards the edge of my diaphragm here, if I'm breathing here, and letting the breath out, I'm actually stimulating that nerve. And if I do that enough times repeatedly, it's going to have a light switch effect where I may have been stressed, but maybe six to 12 breaths later of this deep diaphragmatic breathing, my body's now working in its opposite. It's working in its parasympathetic nervous system. So you can think of when you're highly stressed as your sympathetically dominated state. And the other division of your nervous system is your parasympathetic nervous system. We want to allow your body to go into the PNS, the parasympathetic nervous system. I know it's very wordy. I'm trying to get this as simply as I can, but it basically helps your body heal itself. In yoga, we're not fixing anything. We're just getting out of the way. We're allowing the body to do its job because it knows better a lot of the times. So when we can breathe or chant, so there's a lot of benefits of chanting, making noise, we block the release of stress hormones. That's a big deal. Just by even singing regularly, you can help calm your body down. So some of the benefits of chanting from uh, recent studies um, is that it increases your immune function. It helps keep your muscle and joints flexible. It helps you, um, if this is something you're looking for, achieve uh, greater weight loss in a shorter span of time. It's because it blocks that release of the stress hormones. So we're looking at how do we balance, how do we lower cortisol levels and keep our body um, in the state where it's constantly healing, regenerating? How are we keeping our brain constantly firing? Um, also, um, this was a study, this um, one at the Eschanga Center. This was people um, doing this three days a week for 30 minutes a day. That's not a big ask to do physical changes in your brain. So it helped reduce their mood, uh, anxiety, improve their mo uh, mood, and had increased control over their breathing. 
So now let's look at this. This is a diagram called Your Brain on Yoga. So we looked at some of the structures in the depressive brain, and I'm gonna to point to this green structure in the front where you'll see it labeled as prefrontal cortex. You might see PFC for short. And that's, again, the area that gets most impacted through depression, HD, chronic pain. This part of the of brain will be affected. So through practicing different yoga practices, you can grow back your gray matter here. Gray matter here literally growing back your brain, as well as your neurotransmitters. So we talked about the neurons not communicating. You looked at that chronic stress video. When we practice things like conscious breathing, moving exercises, you're increasing the signal between neurons in your brain, meaning different areas of your brain are going to able, be able to communicate better with one another on a regular basis and you're preventing age-related decline and also environment-related decline you want to keep your brain this is your control center as your number one focus okay and then we'll look downwards you see that little walnut shaped guy in the center it kind of looks like an ear but it's inside the brain that is your amygdala and your hippocampus that's part of your older brain i had mentioned that your prefrontal cortex part of your newer brain your older brain is your what we call your reptilian brain or your limbic brain so if you look to um, those little structures at the bottom we know that with um chronic stress, depression, and HD, the hippocampus particularly, and the amygdala are affected. So the hippocampus is where um, you regulate your memory, your emotion, your learning, and also a bunch of hormones um, play a factor there. When that decreases in size through chronic stress or depression, you have less of a time, you have less of an ability to handle those things. You don't have as much control. When we practice meditation and meditative movement, we grow back our gray matter there, meaning what has shrunk can start to get bigger, meaning you will have better memory, better focus, better move in literally six to eight weeks. So if that doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. Um, because <laughs> there used to be a saying when I was growing up that... Um, um, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Turns out you can teach any dog new tricks as long as they um, have the faculties to do the movement. So that's really important. And then that amygdala, which is your fear center. So imagine the amygdala getting so big in a person that's been worried constantly that it kind of goes haywire. It's just overly active. When we do things like uh, breathing, meditation, moving meditation, chanting, we're calming down that amygdala, your fear center. You won't experience as severe anxiety. And over time, it will um, reduce the amount of anxiety. So we're looking at all the places in your brain that get affected just by breathing and moving consciously is one of the coolest things ever. Um, so we'll look at some of the things that we're looking at here when we talk about exercise in the brain. So we talked, that was a diagram specifically to yoga, but now let's look at what other things do. So lifting weights, if you look at the top diagram, you should see it on your left and you'll see this little um, grid. Lifting weights heavily um, increases activity in your prefrontal cortex. It helps you with complex thinking, reasoning, multitasking, and problem solving. Who doesn't need more help problem solving? <laughs> you know, yoga, <laughs> frontal lobe, right? You're looking at high intensity interval training, hypothalamus. So high intensity interval training is part of the, pro is part of the practices we're going to be doing in our Saturday 1 um, p.m. classes. That is going to consist of sports specific drills, which is going to help you um, switch between tasks. It's going to help you with your visual spatial processing. It's going to help you with your memory, your attention. And also it's going to be, again, a positive stressor, a stressor on your heart, on your body, and then a calm down. So you're able over time to have this adaptive response in your nervous system that you're able to handle more stress over time. If you look at the diagram on your right, which is the black one, it'll show um, exactly how the neurons communicate. So you look at a, a brain that has no physical exercises and there's this little gap between neurons and the gene and the signal. So there's a, a, a chemical that's made when we exercise regularly. It's called BDNF. 
This is called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This substance helps you helps the neurons survive and grow and transmit signals to other parts of your brain. This is essential um, for our ability to remember and to learn new things. So you want to be making this chemical in your body. Your body makes this chemical. That is so cool. Our bodies are chemical factories. We can influence by our actions and the steps we take what chemicals we are inviting them to make and how we are regulating or down-regulating down some of the more harmful chemicals like cortisol from the stress response. So high-intensity in, high, uh, interval training, um, or HIT for short, the benefits of that is that that also increases BDNF. It also enhances your motor function, your learning, your memory, your attention. Um, it doesn't have to be um, really like, in, like um, the workouts are not, they don't have to be done for an athlete. Like when we start going through our training, you'll see just basic body weight things we're going to do with these interval trainings. It's also used to help people with stroke, Parkinson's disease, and ADHD because it starts to really uh, hone and utilize more aspects of your brain at once. If you're going to do a workout program, you might as well do one that works out as many parts of your brain as you can at once so that you're maximizing your time and you're minimizing, um, you're minimizing waste. So meditation. Sometimes this seems very daunting. Well, I can't sit, Natalie. Um, I don't know how to meditate. All I do is think and I go, okay, you can't do it wrong. So putting that out there, meditation translates as to become familiar with. What are we becoming familiar with when we're sitting or we're standing or walking or lying down? Because meditation is not just sitting. We can walk and meditate. We can move and meditate. That's what I would do, consider a physical yoga practice. You're moving and meditating, linked breath into your motion. You can do it sitting, you can do it standing. It's your ability to focus your mind in one direction without distraction. So you're training that ability in. When we think about what are we becoming familiar with in this process, we're really starting to understand what is happening. If you've not meditated before, you don't have a previous experience with it, then this might be foreign to you, but I encourage you to try it out. It's not that we're stopping the flow of thoughts, it's that we're concentrating and we're watching all the other activities that the mind is doing. And for a lot of people, that's overwhelming because we have 50 to 70,000 thoughts. Our brains are wired for negativity. Most of them are not great. They're jumping from your past experiences to future projections that may not be so nice you know, catastrophizing on one side and then in the present moment you feel anxious. So it's easier just to pick up your phone or to do something mindless or watch a show than it is to sit with those thoughts. So that's usually people struggle is like they can't turn off their mind. Well, what if you didn't have to turn it off? What if you just started with tolerating it and focusing on your breath as it comes in and out? This is your brain after meditation. So a normal person's brain is there on the left. After 15 minutes, you can see a balance between your brain hemispheres. You're right in your left side of your brain. You get greater cohesion and synchronization. It helps to optimize your mental, your emotional, your physical health. So here we get to it. Why are we here? We are offering online programs. This has been a dream of mine to do forever. Um, everything that I've done to heal my body from pain, all the work I've done with all the organization is leading up to this moment where we're able to now expand this program globally for you and your families and your friends and your communities. So we're going to have two um, classes. One is called Functional Yoga and Mobility. This is tailored for HD. These are going to be weekly classes live with Zoom. This is for at-risk and pre-symptomatic folks. So this can be, even if you tested negative and you're impacted, we want all of you participating. This, we will explore how to train your mind and body. We're gonna be exploring conscious movement through yoga postures. You're gonna have an element of HIIT training, an element of relaxation and meditation. So all of the, um, all of, we're going to maximize the effect of this practice in one hour on your brain 
every week. And if you can't make the time that we're hosting it live, we are going to have it available to you on the HDO YouTube page for you to practice anytime you want. And the second um, practice we're going to offer people is chair yoga and mobility. So for folks in their early to mid stages, it's very hard to do a, a virtual training that's not one on one. So chair yoga is something I've also specialized in with my company, Sacred Mountain Yoga. I've been teaching chair yoga for years and I've developed a training to help people and teachers, recreation therapists and people uh, be able to teach yoga and mobility from a chair. Um, these practices will be using a wall as well, depending on the people participating. So if mobility is an issue, if people are starting to have physical, mental decline, this is the practice for them. The goal of this is to, to maintain their current health and prevent against physiological decline. This is very important. It is easier to prevent things in your brain and body from deteriorating than it is to regain it once it's deteriorated. Okay, I need you to hear that right now. It is easier to prevent than to recuperate it. So we want to prevent, and also these um, classes are going to be very vocal. We're going to be utilizing things like chanting, breathing, uh, a sound, because we want to keep the throat this muscle called the platysma muscle, we want to keep the diaphragm, we want to keep these muscles strong so that we can avoid choking, aspiration ammonia, and things that are affecting uh, ourselves, maybe in the future, or the people that we love. We want to keep them swallowing and eating on their own and communicating and talking. My mother can no longer speak. Um, this is a stage where it gets really tricky and very hard. Um, and if I can help somebody else, um, have a few more years of talking, then my life's work is done, really, honestly. So is this program for you? I don't know. You can answer some of these questions for yourself. Uh, do you feel pain or discomfort? Do you manage stress well? Do you often feel angry, resentful, frustrated, or pity? Are you at the mercy of your thoughts? Do you want to make changes in your life? Do you have already anxiety, depression, and issues that you're dealing with or disturbed sleep? because this is a choice that you'll you'll be able to make now yoga helps us to cure what need not be endured and to endure what cannot be cured my message to you whether or not you're gene positive this method of healing will prepare you for your life it's a way of living with awareness of your personal responsibility that you need to take the actions and actions and decide whether you want to become a warrior a warrior is somebody that has fear and does it anyways, that has worry and does it anyways. You have to be ready to take the physical step of showing up to the classes, of putting on the YouTube, of setting time in your schedule to do this for yourself. Wishing for an easier life is useless. It's useless. You could wish, you can pray to the cows come home. It's not going to change anything. But building the strength you, leave, you need to live this one is actually possible. It's about your choices. Each thought, each word, each action. We make choices that lead to wellness or we make choices that lead to illness. You can join me and pursue wellness. Take control of whatever you can. Thank you so much. And we're going to open up for your Q&A now. So Chandler is going to yes. unmute everybody and add you as panelists and we can talk and you can let me know Meeting. your thoughts, your feedback, how you're feeling. Did I give you an information overload? Because I, <laughs> it could be a little bit overwhelming. It may not actually let me on this the way we registered it. Uh, we can allow them to talk though. Yeah. Yeah, you're the host now. Oh, that's why I won't let me do it. Oh, okay. Hold on. Participants. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, if you, I'm going to reclaim the host position. Okay, cool. And now I could, I was like, why is it not? So I'm going to promote everyone to a panelist. Again, if you don't want to be on video, just take yourself off. Yeah. Uh, and you also, yeah, you can still unmute yourself and um, not have your video on and ask okay. questions or give me some feedback. How was that for you? And last one. 
There you go. And unmute. Ask the TV and just let them know. There you go. Everyone is unmuted now. Again, you can choose to turn on your video or not, but if you have questions for Natalie, Natalie, I just want to say thank you so much. I'm so excited to get the practice started this weekend. Um, and um, yeah, we're just forever grateful for you. But does anybody have specific questions for Natalie or about how our weekend classes will run? Or even just feedback. Oh, we have a new message. Let me check. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, so you can type in the chat. If you don't feel like talking, um, you can type in the chat if there's any questions. If you let me know, it would be helpful for me, like, um, what is it like to now know this information? Like, do you find this helpful? feedback now but um yeah okay we have i like very much i will oh, okay ah oh, as soon i'm so excited we'll see you on saturday hopefully it's good for your timing can you, can you hear me yeah oh can you hear me now okay well congratulations i really like it very much i think that it's a really nice combination about motivating people and also Good knowledge about yoga so thank you so much uh thank you so much for being here with us okay anna you're in anna writes it's exactly what i'm trying to integrate into my classes count me in yes yes anna good job i'm really happy to hear that fiona nicole anything I'm just putting you on the hot spot. You don't have to answer. <laughs> I just want to say thank you. I thought it was very interesting. And um, yeah, I very much look forward to Saturday. Awesome. Oh, Nicole, where are you from? Uh, I live in the UK. Sweet. So we have Spain and the UK, Canada, the States, Scotland's here. Wow. <laughs> So I would encourage you, um, once this video is up, if you have a community that you um, can share this with, I would share this with as many people as you can and, and, and really let's start um, moving in a direction that is a little bit more positive. I know that there's a lot of um, research happening right now in the ET world, um, but to balance expectations, um, we're not going to know the results of that for several years. So that's down the pipeline when we're thinking of treatments, cures, medications. Um, so in the interim, it's going to be helpful for anybody here that might be HD positive, who's not symptomatic or mildly symptomatic, to keep your faculties as well as you can so that you can start using those medications and you can get into those studies um, as they open up and as they change. If you can be as healthy as you can entering in, Okay, thanks. Um, um, you're going to give yourself the best chance for success in anything that you do in your life. Amazing. Well, again, I'm so excited um, that you guys are open to joining us. The Zoom links were sent in emails yesterday. They are also on our Facebook page. You can email myself, Chandler, C-H-A-N-D-L-E-R at hdyo.org. If you need um, links, we'll be getting new links for each week so we can keep track of registration. So stay tuned to social media. I will also be blasting out emails with the weekly links um, for the classes. And in two weeks uh, from today, at the same time, we'll be doing another webinar with Natalie about filling your cup and living sort of a fulfilling life. Um, so a follow up to this after a couple weeks of, of yoga practice. So, um, you know, stay tuned. Um, HDO, we are here to support you guys. If you guys have resources that you're still sort of looking for in this very uncertain and, and time that none of us were quite prepared for, please reach out. We're happy to work with associations and individuals to help make sure that we're continuing to make sure that the right supports are in place for everyone. There's amazing work going on all over the world. Um, Natalie put her email in the chat box as well. Yeah. I should probably write it. Good, good call, Natalie. Um, you guys can email me or in, 
anyone at HDO if you have a contact and we will email those out. Please share freely. We'd love to see as many people as we can. And of course, we have a month scheduled out and we will update it as we need with we, as we see how things go. So um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you all um, for you know spending this time with us. And Natalie, thank you so much for partnering with us to launch this program. We are very excited about it. So thank you everyone. I look forward to seeing you all soon. Be safe, be healthy, be well, um, and we'll talk soon. Thank you everybody. All right, bye-bye. Bye.